Okay, we're going to move right to our guest speaker tonight. Our guest speaker is uh, Justice Charles Krager. Uh, Justice Krager is from Klein, Texas. He received a bachelor's degree in arts in 1982 from the University of Houston. In 85, he earned a Doctor of Jurisprudence degree from South Texas College of Law, which is also in Houston. Justice Prager practiced law for 18 years before he was elected to the Ninth Court of Appeals in 2004. The court is located in, in Beaumont and hears appeals from the trial courts from 10 counties across Southeast Texas, including Montgomery County. Justice Prager was re-elected in 2010 to a six-year term on the court. He presided over, he has presided over approximately 1,500 cases and has participated in the resolution of almost three times that many appeals while on the court. With more, he has had more than 900 of his opinions cited in various legal reports. He has also only been reversed twice, once by the, uh, the Supreme Court and once by the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. We'll have to hear about that. <laughs> Justice Prager has been married to his high school sweetheart since 1977. They have two adult children and three wonderful, he says, wonderful grandchildren, grandsons, I think they all are. And he says that after having spent last week <coughs> taking care of them with his wife. So they must be truly be wonderful. Uh, Justice Prager is the past director of the Montgomery County Bar Association and the Woodlands Bar Association and has served on the boards of various civic organizations in Montgomery County and Conroe. He's a frequent speaker and lecturer at high school government classes and, and at continuing legal education seminars for attorneys. He and his wife are active members of the Conroe Community Church. And if that, if you would welcome, please welcome Judge Charles Perry. Thank you very much. Uh, the only thing I'm willing to say about the reversals is that I learned quickly, <laughs> and I won't ever do that again. Uh, but I am proud to say that the uh, one reversal that I did have with the Texas Supreme Court involved the Denbury Green Pipeline. And uh, we have the rule of stare decisis in Texas, and so I was pretty much bound to, to rule the way I had to. And when it got up to the Texas Supreme Court, well, when I had it, I had one brief for the appellant side, one brief for the appellee side. When the Supreme Court ruled upon it, they had 31 briefs on their uh, docket, so they had amicus briefs filed from all different organizations throughout the uh, state and country, and they actually changed the, uh, the law concerning pipelines in Texas uh, with that case. So uh, we've gone on and expanded uh, on their ruling to uh, bring the procedures in line with what they dictated in that case. It's been a, it was a very interesting process to watch it unfold. Uh, it wasn't fun to have my name banded around up there, though. But uh, I thank you tonight for that warm welcome. I thank you especially for allowing me to serve on the Ninth Court of Appeals for this past 10 years. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that y'all do to help conservative candidates get elected in this county. Um, I want to thank you especially to allow me come speak to you on this historic night. You probably say, what's so historic about July the 8th? Well, we just got through <laughs> celebrating the anniversary of our Declaration of Independence on July 4th. On this day in 1776, they had the first public reading of that Declaration of Independence. And you thought, why did they have to, that was in Philadelphia, why did they wait four days before they read it publicly? Well, they had to wait for it to come from the printer. They didn't have the electronic age that we have now where you have instant access. Um, and so as soon as they got to the printing uh, printer, they, they called the uh, gathering and had the public reading in Philadelphia. The Declaration of Independence echoes the words of John Locke. It says, or speaks of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, the Pledge of Allegiance that we just recited ends with the words, uh, with liberty and justice for all. Liberty implies a system of rules. Uh, it's a network of restraint and order. For the founding fathers of our nation, liberty was the fundamental American value that they fought for. They sought protection from the arbitrary power of the state. Sounds familiar today. We're still fighting that, that fight today. There was no real system of rules, 
and they were always changing at the whim of those in power. It was liberty that Patrick Henry declared himself willing to die for, give me liberty or give me death. And it was liberty that the ringing bell in Philadelphia proclaimed on July 8, 1776. Uh, outside my chambers in Beaumont, on the wall of the uh, courthouse, is inscribed the words, let liberty be regulated by law. And I've come to appreciate that that really describes the central function of the Court of Appeals and the legal system. And I know our Chief Justice spoke to you all a while back here. I watched his speech so I make sure I wouldn't just repeat everything that he told you all. But our role, uh, as John pointed out, was to hear appeals from all of the state trial courts in the 10 counties in Southeast Texas, from Montgomery County over to Louisiana and up to the lake areas. Um, and what we do is we regulate the decisions of those trial courts to assure that they're in accordance with Texas law. Our court has to consider every appeal that comes before it. We don't have any discretion, unlike that of the Texas Supreme Court and the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, which are our two highest courts in the state for the civil and the criminal, respectively. They uh, also review our work. All of our decisions are written, and they can be appealed either to the Texas Supreme Court or the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. And there are certain factors that those courts use when they consider deciding whether or not they're going to hear an appeal from our court. And uh, right after I was elected, uh, I sat in the office, and everything about election is very surreal. Um, we had a hard-fought uh, primary campaign against Ralph Harrison. Uh, I was unopposed in the general. But I can remember everything about, uh, there were first all over the place. And after all of that controversy, all of that hard work, uh, when it came time for me to take office, I replaced, by the way, the most liberal Democratic judge in the state of Texas, and he was proud of that title, uh, Don Burgess. And uh, on that day, he got up and shook my hand and walked out, let me have his office. I didn't have to call the military or the police to have him removed. Uh, it was very, it was very civil. And uh, it, it's just neat about the way uh, America works like that. Some of the factors that the Texas Supreme Court uses in deciding whether or not to hear our, our, our cases, our people's market, or whether or not justices of the Court of Appeals disagree on an important point of law. Another one is whether or not the case involves the construction or validity of a statute or of the Constitution. But the one that really struck me the, the most and sent chills down my spine after I was elected reading it again, because it just had a whole new light to it, is whether or not the Court of Appeals appears to have committed an error of law of such importance to the state's jurisprudence that it should be corrected. And I was sitting there going, wow. At that point, I realized that a decision I may make or an opinion that I may issue could affect the state of jurisprudence in the state of Texas. And knowing that all of my opinions would be reviewed by all every lawyer in the state, all the law school professors, as well as you know the press and newspapers, it really makes you concentrate on every word of every paragraph of every opinion to make sure that those legal principles are sound and are applied logically. We strive in our job for certainty, for predictability and stability, so that you as citizens might regulate and conduct your business and enter into relationships knowing what the law is. And you can have reasonable assurance that you know what the law is and how it's going to affect the situation that you're entering. We're not concerned contrary to popular belief about who's before us. We're not concerned who the lawyers are, we're not concerned who the parties are, and we're not really concerned about which trial judge we're hearing the appeal from. Uh, as you'll hear later on, our workload is such that we don't have time to, to worry about that kind of thing anyway. But what we're concerned about is the correct application of the law and the future of the law as interpreted through our opinions. Um, what you may not know is that each of our opinions are published and they're bound in these law school books and they're online and all these web searches and all of those contain legal precedent and the courts in Texas are bound to follow our decisions as long as they're upheld by the upper courts. Um, 
when we're considering an appeal, we don't simply just substitute our opinion for that of the trial judge or the jury. A lot of people want us to, well, you know, y'all need to get it right. Well, we can't just second guess a judge or a jury. There are a lot of rules that we have to go by. And I brought the, uh, the book, this is just one of them, that govern the standards of review that Court of Appeals have to, are governed by. They set the parameters by which we uh, are bound to hear appeals. And they're all based upon basically who had the burden of proof down the trial court below. They've been developed over many, many years to ensure that both sides have a fair trial and a fair hearing on the Court of Appeals. Um, you know, our, our judges do a very good job at the trial court. They are dealing with the live people, with the emotions of each of the cases, and they're having to make snap decisions on objections and rulings uh, from the bench. And believe it or not, most of them do a very good job. Uh, most judges uh, are affirmed. The ones uh, that we find some error on it doesn't necessarily mean that the judgment has to be reversed. Because if we do find that the, that the court erred in some procedural matter or some ruling on the admission of evidence, uh, we have to do what's called a harm analysis after that and determine whether or not that error caused an improper or was likely to cause an improper verdict. And it's only if we find that it likely did cause the rendition of an improper verdict that we reverse the trial court. Otherwise, we find that he committed error or she committed error, but it was harmless and therefore the judgment should remain. Um, we're restricted to the evidence that was presented in the trial court below. We don't have witnesses, we don't take testimony. They prepare everything and now it's all electronic form, but it's, uh, they used to bound it in these bound volumes and bring it up to us, but we read the transcripts. So we sit in our office all day long reading transcripts of trials and looking at the evidence in the exhibits. Um, I always tell everybody I scared my secretary one day because uh, I get there early in the morning. Uh, since I live here in Conroe and the ports in Beaumont, I have a little apartment over in Beaumont. And uh, there's really nothing else to do. I have an efficiency apartment, so there's nowhere to move around. So I go to the courthouse and break at dawn. And I'm in there reading. And I get up to go get a second cup of coffee and walk out. And my secretary jumps two feet out of her chair because she didn't know I was in there because I've been there so early. But uh, it's, it's a great job. And um, I literally, after 10 years, I still wake up every day anxious to go back to work in the court. And I, I think when you can say that after 10 years, you really enjoy your job. Um, I was going to give you some examples uh, about how these standards of reviews govern our review of an appeal. Uh, the simplest case is a, a criminal case. We hear criminal, we hear civil, family law cases. We hear all these sexually violent predator cases that come through Montgomery County. Uh, the only thing we don't hear are criminal cases that end up with the death penalty. Uh, they go straight to Austin. But there are certain elements in a crime that the state has the burden of proof to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And if somebody challenges whether or not there was sufficient evidence to support a conviction in the in a criminal court, we take it. We take that evidence and we look at it in light most favorable to the verdict. And then we, we determine in looking at it in favor of the verdict whether or not the state put on reasonable evidence of each element of that offense beyond a reasonable doubt. If they did, then it's affirmed. And if they didn't, then you're forced to reverse it and remand it back for new trial or quit if they didn't present evidence, any evidence of a certain element of crime. So we we have very specific issues that we are looking at. We're not simply just second guessing the, the trial judge and jury. Um, I was said earlier that our caseload has been very heavy. Over the past five years, there has been an average of right at 11,500 appeals filed across the state of Texas. There are 14 courts of appeals, there are 80 appellate judges. So out of the 80 judges, we've got to divide up 11,500 appeals. So. At, keeps us quite busy. Uh, there are four judges on our court, and each judge writes approximately 125 opinions a year. Now, some of those can take very long. Uh, some of them are going to be 30, 40 pages long. But we issue about 500 opinions a year in our court. Um, 
I was going to compare it with the Supreme Court. I don't know, they're my bosses and they're recording this, but um, they have nine judges on their panel. They hear about, they consider about a thousand cases a year. They issue about a hundred opinions between the nine of them. And so we're a little bit busier than the Supreme Court, although they have more important cases that they have to write upon. But the cases are split pretty well evenly between civil and criminal on the appeals. They're about 50% each. <clears throat> I noticed over the years that we're not seeing the same type of cases that we were when I first got on the court. Uh, no longer do we see the mom and pop, you know, sore neck motor vehicle accident case. Um, what we're seeing now are these huge multi-million dollar civil cases. Or, on the other end of the spectrum, we're seeing a lot of pro se appeals. These people are having a tough time affording attorneys. And both of those cases require a lot of man hours uh, for different reasons. Uh, we have to really struggle to help and make, try to see what the pro se litigant is trying to appeal, what their complaints are. And those take a lot of time to go through the records, read most of it. A lot of prisoners do it in handwriting, so we have a lot of handwritten briefs and we have to decipher their writing. And then you have, on the other side, you have the huge multi-million dollar verdicts that require a lot of time because those trials go on for weeks and weeks and the volumes and volumes of, of testimony that we have to go through. And just like every other government agency in these days, we've had to learn to do more with less because of budget crunches. And so we're learning to work more efficiently. And so each of us now get these little iPads to carry around. I'm trying to learn how to use it, but I need one that's about this big so I can see it. Uh, but uh, we're, we're traveling to, we hear uh, oral arguments, not only in Beaumont, but we come over to Conroe to, to hear it. Uh, there's some talk that in this upcoming legislative session, they, they're going to talk about doing away with the 14 courts of appeals and maybe consolidating them down to four or five courts across the state. And um, personally, I'm really against that. Uh, one, I don't see the cost of efficiency of doing that. Uh, from what I understand, we're still going to remain seated in Beaumont. We would just be the Beaumont division of the fifth court or something like that. But all it would do is maybe cut down on a clerk from each court. But they're concerned about, the, what I've heard is they're concerned about the differences in opinions, uh, different courts of appeals ruling differently on the same areas of the law. And I don't think with the way we sit in panels of three judges each that it's going to have a big effect on the jurisprudence in our state. Um, I'm from a very blue collar family. My dad probably never made more than $40,000 a year. He had six kids to support him. I would have never had an opportunity to sit on this court if we consolidate these courts down to the big metropolitan areas in our state. Um, they can set up a blue collar, I mean a uh, blue ribbon committee to recommend appointments by the governor to these, to these courts. And you will have only those attorneys that come from the large firms in the metropolitan area serving on these courts. So I think that the people want to have a say in who they elect as their judge. I think they want to have their cases decided in their neighborhood by locally elected judges. So uh, I, I would urge y'all to, if you have a chance, if it comes up in this legislative session, contact your representative and indicate that, you know, you don't think it's a good idea to, to mess around with our court systems. We have some, some issues that can be resolved to make our courts operate more efficiently. But that's for another time. But um, I don't think what they're proposing in the consolidation of the Court of Appeals is, is good for our state. Maintaining a conservative judicial philosophy uh, and ideology in our, in our Court of Appeals. I don't feel like I have an agenda. I have 200 years of precedent to rely upon. So I feel very comfortable in the positions that I take on the court. But those that would not share our conservative ideology, I feel do have an agenda. They found that they haven't had any luck through the electoral process in getting people, like-minded people elected, nor have they had much success in the legislative branch of the government. So what they have done now is they have gone through the 
legal process, and they've gone to these liberal state courts and the federal courts, and they've obtained judgments. And what I described in one meeting earlier is that there are storms on the horizon because they have taken those judgments down and brought them to Texas, and they're trying to force us to recognize and abide by the judgments of other courts and the federal courts that may be contrary to Texas law uh, through the full faith and credit clause of the Constitution. And I know the Texas Supreme Court already has a couple of those cases pending. Uh, they have one more date this term to, to publish opinions. If we don't see it um, this next time, it'll probably be next year before we, we see a decision out of them. But it is going to be the robe has become very weighty, put it that way, in the future. Because I see maintaining our conservative ideology is going to be a real challenge uh, in the upcoming cases, mainly in the area of family law in our state, is where we see most of the, uh, the, the liberal agenda coming through there. And um, I just want you to know, if I've got to sit there for six years and write dissents, I'll do that. <laughs> but I'm... I'm going to stick to my conservative ideology, and I'm going to maintain Texas law uh, no matter what it takes. And so I appreciate you asking me here tonight. I appreciate your support for all of us. I cherish your prayers. Uh, we, we can't do this job alone. Uh, we have to ask for guidance and discernment each and every day. And uh, I cherish your prayers uh, for our court and our state. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'm willing to entertain questions, that, except for the front row here. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Um, I'm not sure I understand the process. And so there are four judges. A case comes in to the court. And does one judge write the opinion and then you have the affirmations and the dissents? Or? Well, we sit in three judge panels. So three judges are, are randomly assigned to each case. And they are also assigned randomly to an author and judge in our court. So one judge will be assigned to write it. They will, we go through a process of deciding whether or not we're going to have oral arguments. If not, we gather the briefs, the records, and then we, the judge that's been assigned as the authoring judge, we begin work on it. And after they obtain a draft of their proposed opinion, they will circulate it among the other judges on the court, not just the two on the panel. In our court, we circulate among all four of us, and we all have input in the uh, final editing of that opinion. But the only three that are assigned to it get to vote on the case. Before an opinion is approved, it has to have a majority vote. So you need to have at least two votes. If we take a vote and the authoring judge is on the out, then we reassign the case to a new judge, have them go back and write an opinion in accordance with the vote. And then a lot of times the initial authoring judge will attach his opinion or her opinion as a dissent, uh, which is, simply means it's a strong feeling you have that you disagree with the court, uh, with, with which way the court is ruling. A lot of times uh, we've had one case that I know of where we're bound by precedent. We had to rule, Judge Horton, I believe, was the authoring opinion. And uh, he wrote the opinions in accordance with Texas law. We disagreed with it, it was time to change. So what we did is we actually got together, the same three judges, and wrote the dissent. Uh, one of, I think Judge Galtney was the uh, signing uh, justice on that opinion. But we all had input on both the majority opinion and the dissent. And we, te we teed it up for the Supreme Court, what we saw the problem with the issue. And sure enough, the Supreme Court took it up, they looked at it, and they actually reversed themselves on some some established precedent and ruled with the dissent. So it's not always a bad thing to get reversed. So sometimes we, we plan it that way and work hard to do that. Yes, sir. You mentioned something about a potential threat coming to the domestic side. Were you maybe speaking to something like definition of marriage or more like how divorce is handled or could have been, could have been, <laughs> could have been. Uh, there are two cases that I know t uh, pending in the Texas Supreme Court right now. One's from Dallas, and the other one I think is from Fort Worth. 
but one of them was a same-sex marriage out of state, uh, and then they came to Texas and they're trying to get divorced. Um, I believe the other one is whether or not same-sex marriage can occur in Texas. So we've had um, we've had issues involving child adoption, uh, visitation, that sort of thing, involving uh, the LBGT agenda. So um, it's a uh, it's a different world. Um, I, I, I disagree that, I can't believe that for 200 years we've been wrong. So they're going to have to convince me. Yes, sir. Of all the cases you've seen in the last 10 years, the one that sticks out more than any other is the change of the law, maybe one we're talking about here. The, the Denbury Green case. It's funny, the, um, I, I did a search in preparation for the uh, talk tonight of my name, uh, we, we can search our term on the uh, Westlaw, they call it, and you can actually pull up all the decisions that I have written on there. And I had over 900 opinions that they cited on there. The one that has been cited the most by other courts across the Texas is the one that's been criticized the most. So each, each of the cases have a different impact on you. Um, the one court, the one case that I uh, really felt strongly about was probably the uh, decision out of the, uh, I'm trying to remember the, the name of the town, the, the cheerleaders. Uh, well, it wasn't Santa Fe, but it's one up north of us. But uh, we had a cheerleader case where they were wanting to put, and they were allowed to put, Bible verses on their run-through signs, and somebody sent an email to some organization on the East Coast, and they sent a letter and started causing all kind of trouble. Nobody was complaining about Silsby, is in Silsby, and uh, they wanted me to reach the issue of whether or not that was a violation of the First Amendment. But fortunately for me. Um, the case was moved by the time it got up to me. And uh, that's the way I held. I held those moot. They're appealing it to the Texas Supreme Court. Uh, it's in the briefing process right now. So we'll see. But the, uh, the school board changed their policy uh, after the lawsuit was filed uh, to allow them uh, to, to ensure that their principals would not discriminate against messages that may have a biblical theme to them. And, and so, therefore, there was no more controversy between them because they weren't being prohibited from doing that. And uh, I just um, I hope that the attorney for the cheerleaders knows what he's doing by appealing it up to the Supreme Court because uh, the case law is not that favorable in, in that light. Because on school districts, schools have a uh, tremendous ability to control what's said uh, on campuses. And so that's not probably the best fact situation to approach a First Amendment case like that. Anybody else any questions? I'm waiting on the big one here. Oh, John? I wanted to ask, but do you have a call? We have actually gone to full-time briefing attorneys. Um, we found that we were spending most of our time interviewing and training new people all the time. And we decided to hire full-time attorneys. And i tell you what, we've been blessed. We've got some great writers. Um, I recently hired a Baker Box player who was making more than I was. And while she wanted to come to work on the Court of Appeals, I was just blessed that she did that. But she is the former editor of the Baylor Laurel School uh, Law Journal and uh, is a tremendous writer. And so each of us have two uh, lawyers and a legal assistant. And it takes all of us to keep it going. We're turning out. You can be doing a criminal case one hour and pick up a family law case and a sexual predator case comes in the door. And by the time all of us, we have a unique collegiality on our court in that I told you that all the, all the judges are given input into the decisions because we want to make sure we get the best decision that's out there. And we have some pretty heated debates, as you can imagine. And when you've gone all day with three other judges and a couple of the lawyers, arguing and debating the law. When you lay your head on the pillow, you know you had a full day. <laughs> and so I sleep very well over there, Beaumont. <laughs>
Yes, sir. Yeah, a question on a criminal. Uh, an appeal on a criminal. Uh, obviously, if it's a, a guilty, uh, they, don't, they don't like the result. Correct. But what level does it have to come to for it to reach you? In other words, does it have to be an allegation of a violation of the law or procedure, or can it be just the result uh, that you can bring it up to you? Well, you have to have a reason to bring it up to us. Uh, yeah. There has to be some allegation of some procedural error, like you said, or a matter of law, uh, insufficient evidence, uh, wrongful admission of some certain evidence, yeah. uh, wrongful stop, uh, violation of the uh, search and seizure. Right. Uh, so we have a lot of different issues that come up. A lot of the pro se guys are just not happy with the, they'll, they'll try to just appeal the verdict, but yeah. you have to either couch it in a legal sufficiency or factual sufficiency or some sort of evidentiary ruling that the trial court made. Okay. Um, I believe the last count is, um, and Judge Horton did a, a review of all of our cases, and we've only reversed like 3% of the criminal cases that come before us. Yeah, so, the, the question on that, usually you, you see this, that at the end, uh, that they, the defense counsel requests that the uh, verdict be set aside and does that take a lot of that off of your plate with the people with the un don't want the uh, uh, don't want, don't like the result as opposed to a, a, la a violation of procedure or going against the law? Well, usually, since they everybody has a right to file an appeal, okay. we have certain rules that attorneys and pro se litigants have to follow to, to brief their stuff. They have to support their positions with law or, or statutes. If they don't, we have remedies that we can either send it back and have them rewrite it, represent it. Uh, a lot of times with the uh, criminal stuff, we just dig through it and try to, our best to determine what issue they're trying to raise. And, and in abundance of caution, we probably raise more issues than what they want us to simply, if there's a, a sentence in the brief that talks about a certain area, we'll go ahead and look at that area just to make sure that, I mean, it's a real person's life. And we all know, we've seen cases now where people do get wrongfully convicted every now and then. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we look at the records and we make sure that there's sufficient evidence to, to support the, the verdict. And we usually look at each one of them that come up there. Do, do, do you ask the prosecution or you wait for them to respond to the brief that's been filed? Yes. Well, what we normally do is we get the record once the notice of appeal is filed with us. The record is filed by the court reporter and the clerk of the court. And then the person who is appealing has 30 days to file their brief with us. And once we receive their brief, and they also ask for extension. We give them some extension of time to get that in. Because lawyers never get it done on time, you know that. But, uh, except for Jenny. But, um, and then once once they get their brief filed, then we set the time, you know, schedule the 30 days for the uh, appellee starts the, the state. A lot of times the state uh, excuses themselves from filing a brief, and we just base it on the record for us at that point. Anybody else? Paul. Okay, I'll preface this with I'm being ever very clearly cold, rainy day about 10 years ago, standing in a early voting parking lot just down the street from here, and uh, looking across the way, and there were two of us campaigning for judges. I looked at the lady across the way, and said, she looks kind of familiar. It's Mrs. Harrison who went to our church. Yes, exactly. Right. Campaigning That's right. Even. But uh, in the proper form, I said, here's the guy I think you ought to vote for if you want to talk to the wife of this opponent. She's over there. I appreciate that. <laughs> My question is, we appreciate that you do what judges should do, which is follow the law, regardless of your own values and point of view. What case has been the hardest for you to rule against your own beliefs and what you thought was right, but the law says it's this way and you had a choice? Well, it wasn't so much that specifically that it wasn't something that I felt the law was wrong. I had a case when I was early on in my career on the court, 
uh, a couple from Conroe. One was an assistant district attorney. Um, they, they both supported me in my election. And uh, she got in trouble. Both of them got in trouble. And it came before us. And the jury or the trial judge had thrown out the case. And when we researched the law, we realized that the trial judge was wrong. And I was going to have to reinstate the criminal charges against my friend, the uh, assistant district attorney. That was probably the hardest uh, because that affected their lives completely as, as it should. But uh, that's probably been the toughest case personally that I've had in the court because, as you can imagine, I lost two friends out of the case. But it, I had to rule in accordance with the law. So. Yes, sir, John. Right. Well, the most glaring example is the one that everybody brings up is Houston has two courts of appeals, the first and the fourteenth. They have the same jurisdiction, and they just have a lot of cases. And it had to do Judge McKeith and Chief Justice is the historian on the court, but. It had to do with the Constitution at that time. They went ahead and created two courts instead of just having one large court. So they each have the same jurisdiction. And what happened was they had a motor vehicle accident involving several passengers, and they all sued. And one case went up to the 14th Court of Appeals, one case went up to the 1st Court of Appeals. Same exact facts, same exact accident. And one court held that they could sue the other court held that the people could not sue. So they have just, you know, glaring conflict of, of rulings there based on the same same fact situation. So we don't see that very often. In fact, I just came back from a seminar in Austin where I met with a bunch of other appellate judges and there was a task force set out to find all of the conflicts between the courts of appeals to try to identify those to see what was causing it and what we could do to help ensure that we don't do that in the future. Um, it was very few cases that we were able to come up with and they were on very minutia points of law. Uh, nothing huge like the, that glaring example, but everybody brings up the case, the motor vehicle case, the first and 14th. Uh, there are some courts up in East Texas that share jurisdiction. Uh, Tyler and Texarkana, they have counties that can go either way. I mean, there are some problems that need to be corrected, and uh, but they need to do an equalization of some of the judges. They need to move a judge from a certain court. I don't know how many cases in Eastland, Texas here, but not many. There, and so they could probably take a judge off that court and put it on, we need a fifth judge in our court. Um, they're trying to keep the ratio of one judge for every 132 cases and right now we're our court we're in the 200s so we're, we're transferring out cases um, not of our choosing but the Supreme Court orders us to transfer them to other courts that need work so. That's exactly right. They could. Believe it or not, Supreme Court didn't accept jurisdiction of the appeals. So, but yeah, that's 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 the idea. Um, it's it's rare, and we pointed out each of our opinions where other sister courts, we call them, have ruled differently. Uh, I'll try to analyze each case that that rule on each side of an issue, and, and and then give a reason why I'm following one side or the other. But. Uh, of course, the district courts, the trial courts in our district are to follow our precedent that we set. So it's not really with the courts below us, it's just with the appellate courts. But yes, the Texas Supreme Court is supposed to be the one to, to resolve the conflicts and the Court of Criminal Appeals. And they do a good job doing that. They let it, what they call, percolate around a while and see the way the people in the courts are handling it, and then they'll make a ruling when they feel the time's right, they get the right case. Yes, sir, I think I'm ready. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I want to give you an opportunity to do a solution of us that you're not the fellow of my court of appeal. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, because now I'm, giving, I'm going to give you an opportunity to blast some folks. <laughs> now tell us what you really think about that court. That, you know, the people a lot of times referred to us as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals just because they hear it all the time on TV because that is probably the most reversed federal circuit of any of them across our, our country. Uh, you know, those judges are from the West Coast. Yeah. What else? Why do you say that? You know, West Coast. That's right. That's what I mean. Centered in San Francisco. That's right. Hey, <laughs> Patrick. Hey, listen, I want to... I, I, there's so much here, but let me tell you, see you in reverse 30% of the cases, criminal cases. And you know that's because of the harmless error. Right in my time, I got some, they had fundamental error going in cases where this court of criminal appeals became sort of when got mad and so forth. It's very simple. I'm mad at some of the district attorneys. Starting reversing, just reversing cases because of fundamental error. Now you've done the opposite thing. You use this harmless air when it's almost impossible to get a reversible jury. Don't look at it and say, well, that jury would have gone and convicted no matter whether this evidence was excluded or admitted. And you, there's no way, I've tried a lot of cases, no way you can sit there and tell what the jury would have done. Very difficult. Very difficult to, to determine, to try to make that determination as whether or not the admission or exclusion of certain evidence probably caused the rendition of an improper verdict. And that's the, that's the standard that we have to go by. And what we do is we take all of the evidence at that point and just look at it to see a lot of the stuff, as you know, is, is repetitious. Um, prosecutors like to put on a lot of witnesses, a lot of evidence, and a lot of it is cumulative. So, but that is the hardest thing because how do you know? I had a case where uh, we had a, a witness that legally uh, I don't think should have been allowed to testify. But the judge allowed that witness to testify. And all it was was really hearsay based upon what the victim had, had told him. Well, the victim got up on the stand and said the same thing. So how can you say that that error allowing that testimony in caused rendition of in improper verdict? Well, in this case, though, that first witness that shouldn't have testified was a police officer. So you know as well as I do, you know, the impact that a police officer testimony has on, on the trial. So that makes it even tougher. So it, it's a, that's a tough call. Now, I know, I know uh, it's politically feasible. I know you said you're conservative and you don't understand these new rulings. Actually, you went pretty far in saying that if I had, if I see one of those uh, uh, mixed marriages or uh, same-sex marriages or divorce marriages, you're not, they're going to have to prove to me. Do you think, you, do you think uh, that might be you've already, uh, you've already proved yourself to be a fair jurist on that? Yeah. Well, I, I don't think so. That's the danger of, uh, of speaking in public is that <laughs> you end up recusing yourself from cases that you elect me to sit on. But. Uh, I think I can still look at the law, but uh, I probably have some preconceived notions as to what I think the law says. But I think we all have those. I, and, I think you're probably all right, but you were right up to the line. I was right up to the that, line. I know that, but that doesn't keep a defense lawyer or, or even a civil lawyer from making the motion of the future sure. and having a big hearing and a big I think you could be I think I could persuade you otherwise. Uh, now, I want to ask you, uh, you know, you've been very complimentary, and like all you judges, y'all say, oh, the judiciary, oh, we're so good. This, I know there's so many sorry judges in life, and so many, I, I, I tell you, I hate to say this, but I'm being generic, but it's the truth. The judiciary is, the, is a branch of government that really is not checked by anything. And I, I just, there's another position here, and there are some bad judges. You let you let down that you think all these trial judges are good and all the appellate judges are wonderful and that. That's not the case. Right. You know, when the chief was here talking, uh, our predecessors, uh, when they were on the court, he told you all about 
back in 1998, out of 39 cases that were appealed out of the Ninth Court of Appeals, the Texas Supreme Court reversed them 39 times. Um, to get, tell you what a change in leadership has done over a decade, the uh, State Bar ran an article in the uh, Law, Law Journal, um, and in 2008, there were 38 cases appealed out of our court to the Texas Supreme Court, and they felt necessary to review zero. So they let all 38 of them stand. So it's quite a change uh, when you try to follow the law. A judge that tries to start working the law to, to have a predetermined outcome is going to get in trouble very quickly. Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot of that. They do fight with their friends a lot of times. Now, the funny thing, the court of law stood with the judge to have, you know, this is favoritism. But here's my last question. Okay. This is the toughest one. It's about a story that appeared in the Congo jury of the day. And I want you to think, if you can't talk specifically about it, I want to talk in general about it. Well, we've got a judge here that this tea party pretty well put it all. And his name is Kelly Kay. Isn't that that's right? And Judge Kay. And this and he may have Davis. Your court may have Davis. Now, I you're probably not gonna go to think you like to make the right decision on that. <laughs> well, the, we get a lot of what they call it, he's asking uh, writs of mandamus are special petitions that come to our court where different parties are asking us to order a trial judge to do something or reverse himself on something. And that's one of the uh, issues that we drop everything we're doing and we look at it immediately at that point and accelerate those. Um, a lot of times the trial judges try to make their, their best judgment on the ruling and sometimes after we review it we find that they, they were wrong. And uh, if, if they had no discretion in the matter, if they have only one decision to make under the law, then we issue the writ of mandamus or tell them either change the ruling or we will issue the writ. And most of them, I don't think we've ever had to issue the actual writ of mandamus. They've, they've complied with our request to change the ruling, and they've done that. But um, you will see, uh, sitting on the, the court, I found early on that those that have a lot of appeals before us, the judges, it's not so much their rulings, their legal rulings. I think it's a matter of how well they, or how unwell, how poorly, they give both sides a feeling that they've had a fair trial. If you give somebody a day in their court, as long as they've had their day in court and they get to make their plea, even if they lose, a lot of times they'll walk away mad, but they'll walk away. But those that want to appeal right away feel like they've been done in unjust. They've been done in injustice. And so we see the, the, the same courts, and you can see the judges mature over time, and they, you certainly see fewer and fewer appeals come out of it. But some of them are pretty hard-headed, but uh, well, that's what judges are. I, that's what we pay them for. It's a personal story. I was talking to you earlier, the only Democrat on the I've got 18 fellow judges in this only Democrat there is a man down named Jim Sharp who's running for re-election this time. Why don't you tell him what Jim Sharp did? I don't <laughs> want to take up too much of your meeting time, but Democrats. we clerked together back in law school, and Jim, uh, and anyway, he, uh, when they moved over to their new, newly renovated Court of Appeals, he wanted to take his own desk, and he wasn't allowed to, and so he put up quite a fuss and got himself in quite a hot water with the uh, Judicial Conduct Commission for standing on top of his desk, screaming that nobody was going to had to come and take it. Basically, is what he was saying. But he was a—he's uh, quite a character. He's very colorful. But uh, thank y'all for having me here tonight. I'm sorry to take up so much of your time. Thank you.